Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to CADAC's webinar on uh, ADHD and sleep. Um, tonight's presentation will be presented by Dr. Margaret Weiss. And um, please enter your questions in the chat box at the bottom, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, CADAC is the only national charity in Canada um, dedicating to improving the lives of individuals and families affected by ADHD. Um, tonight's speaker, as I said, uh, will be Dr. Margaret, and uh, she is best known for her research uh, in demonstrating that melatonin is a safe and effective treatment for initial insomnia in ADHD. Her work on medication development and um, her work on wise functional impairment scale and her recent studies on the quality of life and functional impairment as important outcomes. As a full-time clinician, she has made the agenda of her research, the translation of clinical practice into evidence-based care. And Dr. Margaret has published over 90 peer-reviewed articles relating to these topics. She is also the author of two book chapters on ADHD, and she has co-authored the book, ADHD in Adulthood, a guide to current theory, diagnosis, and treatment. She, is, she was the director of ADHD program at Children's Hospital for 15 years. And she has helped launch and participated in writing the Canadian guidelines for ADHD for the last four editions. So we want to thank you um, and welcome Dr. Margaret for joining us again tonight. And uh, with that said, um, Dr. Margaret, the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so as she was saying, my name is Dr. Margaret Weiss. I work at Cambridge Health Alliance in Boston. I started my career for many years in Montreal and then raised my family in Vancouver. ADHD has been my passion throughout my career. And you can't really study or help patients with ADHD unless you also know something about sleep. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So these are my disclosures. I uh, have uh, spoken for various advisory boards and in various countries. I received royalties for a measure that I created to look at functioning in children and adults with ADHD and also for the book that was mentioned. And what we're going to do today is we're going to look at sleep and ADHD. And I'm going to try and explain to you more about what sleep is, sleep disorders, and why they're so important in ADHD, how to understand and assess them, and what we know about treatment. I'm going to start by just showing you an image for those of you who are interested on a book on sleep and ADHD, which came out recently, which is really a state-of-the-art summary. It's not written for patients, but it's easy to understand, and I think it's a very useful uh, resource. So looking at sleep and ADHD, the first thing to understand is for reasons we don't understand, we don't totally comprehend uh, ADHD is a 24 hour disorder. The same things that we see in children and adults during the day, the hypermotricity, the uh, difficulty settling are also present at night. As a result of which the vast majority of ADHD children will have a sleep disorder. And that sleep disorder may manifest as for a period of time and a difficulty in the architecture of your sleep as manifested if you do a sleep study. However, there are two disorders that are particularly important. The first one is not uh, written here, but I think it's important to understand is night to night variability. What that means is that you fall asleep at a one time on one night and a different time on another night. That's very typical, for example, for adolescents. Adolescents will uh, sleep until two in the afternoon on a Saturday and go to bed very, very late. 
but then have to be up very early in the morning during the week. And so there's a phase shift in their sleep from the day to the night. And that in itself causes problems. But the other difficulty, which is very characteristic of ADHD all the way through the life cycle, is what we call a circadian rhythm sleep wake disorder. What that means is that there's a shift where most people might, for example, be falling asleep at 11 p.m. and waking up at 7. Individuals with ADHD may be falling asleep at 2 in the morning and waking up at 9. So that's called eveningness. They have a shift in when they sleep. That causes difficulty if you can't sleep in and you have a job which demands that you get up early. It's also a particular issue, which we're gonna talk about more later, for adolescents. And for some reason, adolescents seem to like that pattern. So that's what we talk about here, motivated type. Adolescents who deliberately want to stay up till early in the morning and sleep till late. Um, one of the uh, interesting things about ADHD, which has been a particular object of interest for me, is there is a hormone in the body called melatonin, which is released by the pineal gland. And that hormone is released much later in individuals with ADHD. The difficulty that I am describing in which individuals of all ages who have ADHD tend to feel more awake in the evening and less awake in the morning. That may be driven by genetic factors, by external factors such as caffeine, or by habits such as playing video games or using screens late at night, and may be exacerbated also by our treatments for ADHD, namely stimulants. But the net result is sleep deprivation. If a parent has a child with ADHD who doesn't go to sleep until one in the morning and that child can't be left unsupervised, the parents are also gonna be sleep deprived. If they do fall asleep and they leave the child on their own, that child may be unsupervised. If the child can't get up for school in the morning, believe it or not, that can become a reason for special ed placement. And if it's extremely difficult and parents are completely exhausted, the result is going to be that the parents can't cope. It's very hard to parent a child with ADHD. And if that child never sleeps, I had a patient uh, two weeks ago and the foster parents were saying to me, we don't know what to do. He had ADHD and fetal alcohol syndrome, but they were after just a week or two completely exhausted because the child was running around till 4.30 in the morning. So even uh, the uh, severity of uh, difficulty with sleep cycle may engender a difficulty with being able to survive and function in a home placement. So let's talk a little bit about what kinds of sleep problems children may experience or adults may experience. Uh, in childhood, uh, we talk about behavioral insomnia. In other words, I won't go to bed, you can't make me. Anxiety-related insomnia. I can't fall asleep because I'm worried. I'm worried you're gonna die from COVID. We also who have excessive daytime sleepiness, which actually, as I'm going to describe later, has a big effect on functioning. For whatever reason, if the child's not getting enough sleep, they're going to be tired during the day. Uh, all of these things uh, represent uh, the kinds of difficulties that I'm talking about in terms of difficulties with circadian rhythm. There are other sleep problems which are also more common in ADHD such as difficulties from sleep because you can't breathe properly and your brain wakes up in order to get sufficient oxygen or restless leg syndrome, which is movements during the night or periodic limb movement disorder or night terrors. So all sleep disorders have excess in ADHD patients, 
But in particular, I think the ones that are most important and the ones that we can help the most are the circadian rhythm sleep disorders. So when we look at sleep in children, we have to understand how important sleep is. Sleep is critical to maturation, to processing information, to memory, to learning, to organizing, to quality of life, to family functioning, and to health. There's almost nothing that isn't affected by having a good night's sleep. And although we know that the vast majority of children and adults with ADHD are having sleep problems, you can see here that this is not what they're presenting to the primary care doctor. They're not telling the family doctor or the pediatrician that they're having as much difficulty as they are with sleep. This problem is not only present in children, it's present in adolescents and young adults. And if you have ADHD, it's actually a predictor that you will not only have problems with sleep uh, early on, but if you've had sleep problems and ADHD as a child, the likely is that you're gonna have insomnia later on at age 18 as well. Uh, in adolescence, uh, one of the things about adolescence is that intrinsic in that phase of development is a difficulty with a biological tendency, independent of the ADHD, found in all adolescents, towards wanting to do more in the evening and less in the morning. In other words, a phase shift to going to bed later and waking up later. What I typically see in adolescence is that they stay up very late, as I said, on the weekends, and then they have to phase adjust uh, during the week. So adolescents have more sleep problems in general, and ADHD adolescents have even more sleep problems than other adolescents. And the sleep problems are not just with the onset of sleep, but with the efficiency of sleep and also being tired during the day. So many, there are many factors that are contributing to that difficulty with sleep. Uh, right, uh, right now, uh, we see lots of problems with alcohol. Uh, one of the number one reasons for use of marijuana in adolescents with ADHD is to put them to sleep, to settle their brain, to calm the craziness of their thinking and to, to fall asleep. I'm not saying that marijuana is good for ADHD. I'm saying that because marijuana increases appetite and helps you fall asleep, it's one of the reasons that people, uh, especially in adolescents are drawn to it. Uh, other sleep problems include difficulty with scheduling, screen time, uncomfortable sleep environments, and anything that impacts sleep, such as hunger and cold. Perhaps the most serious problem uh, that we have seen emerge over the last decade is the difficulty of electronics. And that is especially being felt right now. As kids have been in online schooling, they're on the computer all day and they're on computers late at night. The computers have created a virtual social life for them, which means that they are on electronics late in the evening. They're getting fewer hours per week. They have more daytime sleepiness as a result. If they have a television in the room, which they're using to deal with their boredom and to keep them up at night, that's going to increase difficulty with start falling asleep and uh, decrease the total sleep time that they get. They are relating to kids more and more virtually and for reasons I don't completely understand, a lot of virtual communication among my teenagers is happening at night. They're playing games together, they're face to, girls are FaceTiming with each other. And so they're up all night on screens 
and then of course they're very tired during the day. But even for those uh, teenagers for whom that's not a problem, what we are asking children to do right now, which is all of their learning online, I think is an extremely difficult challenge for most kids. And as the work increases, and there's no schedule for school, there's no structure for school, there's no reason to wake up in the morning, uh, electronics for homework late at night has become much more common. So that is something I hope that we can talk about in the chat. Some of the difficulties, which all of these things have existed for a long, long time, but I'm seeing a significant exacerbation of them as a result of COVID. Children don't have to wake up in the morning, they're sleeping in. And they're using screens more and more because their parents are working from home and the children need some form of entertainment to alleviate their boredom. When COVID was an acute crisis, it seemed reasonable to break the usual family rules about sleep, about screen time. But uh, now that it's become an ongoing way of life, we have to rethink that issue. Um, I uh, want to give you a website, which is uh, specific to that issue, uh, sleeponitcanada.ca, how to encourage good sleep habits for your children during COVID-19. And one of the things that I have seen during COVID is it's the families that can provide much more structure and schedule and even space for sleep, separate from space for play, separate from space for work that can make a difference. So let's see what the patients say to me when they come in for their ADHD assessments. The most common thing that I've heard from children, uh, which I think is very characteristic of what happens to children with ADHD, I can't turn my thoughts off. Another characteristic is, as you know, children with ADHD and adults with ADHD find it boring to wait to fall asleep. Sleep is an attention demanding activity. You have to, first of all, get ready for bed. Then you have to get into the bed. Then you have to turn off your thoughts and wait for sleep to fall on you. And all of that is extremely difficult if you have ADHD, which may explain why sleep problems are so common and why uh, so many individuals with ADHD end up staying up late and then they get into their hyperfocus. They do something really interesting and it's actually then three in the morning before they fall asleep. Uh, some of the things uh, about ADHD and families that are worth thinking about is the first thing is that uh, as any of you know, who are parents of an ADHD child, it's tremendously hard work. And one of the thoughts then that parents sometimes have is, I have to make sure my child gets a good night's sleep. So they put the, sleep, the child to sleep early. And by putting the child to sleep early, they're thinking that they're giving the child a good night's sleep, but they may be putting the child to sleep before that child is actually ready for sleep. And sometimes they're doing that because they themselves are exhausted. It's not a good idea to use sleep as a babysitter. And oftentimes the amount of sleep that children with ADHD need is actually less than what is usually expected. And it's quite important to make sure that by the time your child is ready to sleep, had time to wind down and that they have uh, gone to bed at a time that's uh, in, uh, appropriate for them in terms of falling asleep. Another thing that is really, really interesting is that it is very confusing both for parents and for scientists that although children with ADHD look like they're overstimulated, they look hyperactive, when we actually test them in the lab with a mean latency sleep onset test, we find that overtired children 
actually can become hyper. So some of you who have experienced children who are not ADHD know that when we see a child being really wild and crazy and silly, we say, oh, he's overtired. That may actually be a very typical state for children with ADHD. Another thing that's very common is ADHD is often a multiplex disorder. That means it exists in multiple people in the family. There may be two children, or there may be a child and a parent, or there may be two children and two parents. And as a result, they may all have a sleep difficulty. Sleep is very much a family affair. Turning out the lights and having a regular bedtime, being able to schedule sleep, which we call sleep hygiene, is a developmental skill and it has to come from the parents. So if in fact the whole household is not on a regular schedule, it's gonna be very difficult to entrain sleep rhythms in the child. When I was first studying ADHD. One of the criteria at that time, I think this goes back as far as DSM-3, was to ask about whether or not a child was a restless sleeper. So at that time, even in the diagnostic criteria for ADHD, being a restless sleeper was one of the symptoms that we considered specific to ADHD. So I said to the children, are you a restless sleeper? And many children answered the question, yes. And I was quite confused. And I said to the kids, how do you know you are a restless sleeper if you are sleeping? And children came up with the most amazing answers, something I could not have conceptualized. I've never woken up in my bed. In one of my sleep studies on melatonin, one of the children said to me that he lost the actograph that we use to measure sleep onset and sleep waking. I said, where did you lose it? And he said, in the rabbit patch. And I said, what are you doing in the rabbit patch in the middle of the night? He said, I'm always out and about all night. So that level of activity is very characteristic of sleep patterns in ADHD. Not always to that extreme, but certainly higher um, motricity at night is very characteristic of sleep in ADHD. When we try and treat that, when we get kids and families on a schedule where they're going to sleep at the same time every night and they're waking up at the same time every morning, sleep improves and it improves around the whole family, the parents, and as one family said, yes, even the dog is sleeping. Another family said to me, yes, Dr. Weiss, even the goldfish are sleeping. So what I'm gonna show you here, because the rhythm of sleep, the time you go to sleep and the time you wake up from sleep is so important, being able to look at your sleep with a sleep diary or some kind of measure of sleep becomes very important to understanding what your directions are. So I've taken this uh, sleep diary from the sleepfoundation.org to give you an illustration of it. But I'm also gonna show you a somnolog. And the somnolog that you see here tells you the day of the week and uh, when you fall asleep and when you wake up. And the advantage of this, this is someone who has a perfect sleep schedule. But let's say, for example, that you were doing this and you had a dark arrow for when you went to bed and then you colored in the boxes for when you were asleep. And then you put an up arrow for when you woke up. If this person had, in fact, let's say, for example, been a teenager, and had fallen asleep at 2 a.m., he would be sleeping in much later. And if you sleep in, for example, till two in the afternoon on Sunday, you're not gonna fall asleep at 9 p.m. to be able to shift your schedule back to go to school in the morning. And that's where the difficulty lies for many of our teenagers. When we are assessing sleep problems, we like the acronym developed by Judy Odens, who's one of the great sleep experts called BEARS. 
And BEAR stands for difficulty with going to bed, excessive daytime sleepiness, waking up during the night, being able to maintain that schedule, and also snoring, which is the sign of uh, obstructive sleep apnea. These are all things that we need to look at and that you can look at when you're looking at whether or not you yourself or your children have a sleep problem. So in trying to address these issues, uh, when there is difficulty with sleep hygiene, changing that sleep training can be very difficult. It's just as difficult as managing any of the other forms of dysregulation in ADHD. So that includes difficulty with eating, difficulty with tidying your room, difficulty with driving. Anything that requires self-regulation can be difficult and sleep is really central and quite emblematic of that. And the converse is also true. If I have successfully trained a child or a family to have a good schedule for sleep, it's remarkable to me how much everything else gets better. The other thing that's important to understand is most of us have the misconception that if we want to have a good sleep schedule, what we need to do is to go to bed early, but you can't go to bed early and fall asleep if you haven't built up a sleep debt. So if you want to change when you sleep, so you want to change when you sleep from two in the morning till nine in the morning uh, to 11 p.m. to 7 p.m., the way that you shift sleep is by changing when you wake up in the morning. You can't just go to bed early when you're not tired. You have to build a sleep debt by waking up early in the morning. And as I mentioned before, because sleep is a family problem, if parents aren't on a good sleep schedule, they're not going to be able to set their children up to have a good sleep schedule. So in many of my ADHD families, one of the parents and the children are playing on games all night. It's a family affair. For adolescents, we also have another problem, which is adolescence is a time of rebellion. So when you say to adolescents, I want you to go to sleep at 10 and I want you to wake up at six, they will sometimes respond by saying, you can't tell me what to do anymore. So in training those kinds of sleep rhythms early and making them habitual, right from the time a child is three to six to nine to 12, is really important in terms of them being able to keep that pattern for themselves when they can make their own choices in adolescence. In our society, there is a very strong feeling that co-sleeping, meaning having children and parents in the bed together is not a good thing. I actually have ambivalence about that because so many of my patients uh, do have uh, some time in bed with their parents. I'm not sure that it's always harmful. And in fact, there are many societies where there isn't more than one bed and it's the routine. So I think there are many components to what goes on in sleep in a family, some of which are complex and some of our rules need to be sensitive and sensitive to uh, the needs of specific families and individualized. So if we do all the things I said, and we provide intervention for sleep that's family-based, that's intensive, that's individualized, that sets up a sleep schedule, we will see improvement in sleep. And when we see improvement in sleep, we'll see uh, likely uh, some improvement in well-being because sleep impacts every aspect of life. As I mentioned before, quality of life, friendships, learning, and everything else. 
um, and also affects, especially in adolescence, uh, even brain development. So ADHD, as I've mentioned, impairs sleep, and we could think about some of the reasons why this might be the case. ADHD is associated with dysregulation, difficulty with everything, with eating, with exercise. As I said, sleep is an attention demanding activity. It's just as bad as homework. It's uh, difficult to go to bed. It's difficult to wait to fall asleep because it's boring. It's difficult to quiet your own thoughts. Um, and it requires some degree of organization. And it's an entrained developmental skill, which means that parents need to help children learn how to fall asleep. One of the concepts of uh, sleep specialists that I particularly like is called the sight giver. Sight giver means time giver. It's that thing that you associate with falling asleep. For me, I always read a novel before I fall asleep. When I read a novel, I just nod off. For other people, it may be listening to music. For other people, it may be story time. For other people, it may be a snack. But there may be an association to a particular trigger for sleep that someone always associates with falling asleep. And that can be quite uh, critical for setting up good sleep habits. So what is sleep hygiene? Sleep hygiene means things that we tell people to do that will help them with their sleep patterns. The first thing is a sleep schedule. And as I said, the most important part of that schedule is when you wake up in the morning. The second thing is to set up that sight gaver, to have some kind of ritual around your falling asleep. The third thing is all the other things that are associated with good life skills, exercise, sound diet, and uh, a reasonable space to sleep in. Uh, in adults in particular, and also in teenagers, drinking too much coffee, uh, drinking too much alcohol, other such things are, can be really important. They may be ways in which someone falls asleep. Alcohol, for example, helps you fall asleep, but it also causes middle of the night wakening. Caffeine keeps you up and then contributes to that delayed sleep phase that I was talking about earlier. But by far the biggest issue, which we'll talk about in terms of change in sleep patterns has been electronics. And the addictive quality of electronics is very striking. So for my children who are, for example, or my adults who are absolutely stuck on gaming, it's fascinating to me that they will even go to sleep and wake up in the middle of the night and go back to gaming. So not having access, what I tell the parents is take away the toys, take the TV out of the bedroom, take away the phones, lock them up at night so that that is no longer an option. What is the treatment for difficulty with sleep? Difficulty with sleep and ADHD is so important and it causes so much distress that actually we often resort to medications. Although the research has shown that the best treatment is what I'm talking about, which is the behavioral treatment. Another very significant issue is that uh, in some areas, I've had children who had to wake up at 5.30 in the morning to get ready for the bus to go two hours to school, which was starting at 7.30, 8 o'clock in high schools which have a double shift day the later you go to school the more friendly it is going to be to have a sufficient night of sleep there are behavioral programs especially in canada canada has been way ahead in this area as a result of the work of kenny corkum uh, better nights better days to offer training to help parents to know all the types of things that I'm talking about in terms of how to set uh, your child up for good sleep. This is an example of Penny Corkum's uh, special program where she is 
providing treatment and researching the results of her intervention to look at how in training sleep rhythms and providing sleep hygiene for children uh, with ADHD can be beneficial. So that's available not only as a research program, but also available um, in terms of a manual. There are also a lot of websites that you can see here. And you can just, I just got this off the internet. You, there is a lot of information on sleep at the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, the Canadian Sleep Society, the National Sleep Foundation, Sleep for Kids. Uh, there's all kinds of websites that are devoted to patient education and resources around sleep. There are also a lot of apps. So you can see here an app for adults, which is based on what's called cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia. And this is providing easy access to something that's actually kind of hard to get. There are not a lot of people that can access sleep specialists or sleep clinics. So this is cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia. And it's a weekly uh, guided training program that helps individuals know how to sleep, what's going to help them with sleep, how to track their sleep, and how to look at their, the success of their sleep outcome. This is probably one of the most famous uh, websites, CBTI. Cognitive Behavior Therapy for Insomnia, and it's an app which does all of the above things. I think that there's going to be more and more electronic resources for sleep as we move forward. And as we move now with COVID into telemental health, I think there's also going to be more access to providing these kinds of resources, not just with the app, but with the interpersonal a support for the app from someone who is familiar with sleep because you won't have to go to the clinic. Um, here I've provided again the resource for uh, dealing with COVID because COVID has really thrown a ringer in all of these things in two ways. One is children no longer have to wake up to go to school. Theoretically, they do if they're in online school, but very often online school has a limited uh, time of access. And if kids are late or missing it, there's nothing, to, there's no bus to get on. So kids are sleeping in later and going to bed later. And uh, that's further complicated by the fact that parents are also stressed. They're working from home. They've lost their structure. So although I said the more structure, the better in helping families to manage COVID, in fact, setting up that structure is very difficult. And without that structure, uh, one of the things that we see is a lot of difficulty with uh, sleep hygiene. If you do manage to successfully use cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia, it's going to help you to avoid medications. And that's actually quite important because what the research shows is that behavioral treatments work. They work better. And more importantly, they endure. Once you learn them, you have them. Whereas if you take a medication, it may help you in the very short term, but in fact, the medications that we use with the exception of melatonin tend to be habit forming. And in the long run, they don't work as well as behavioral interventions. So I mentioned that the most significant um, uh, exception to this is melatonin. And there's an awful lot to know about melatonin and uh, use of melatonin in children with neurodevelopmental disorders, both ADHD and autism has uh, become, I would say more common than not. Melatonin is a hormone that's produced by the pineal gland. It regulates sleep and many other aspects of circadian function. It even regulates when bears go into hibernation. So it's the time clock of the body. 
These days you can get melatonin in any format. You can get it as a pill, as a wafer, as a gummy bear, as a liquid. And so it's available for any child of any age in any dose, whatever their restrictions are for their capacity to swallow a pill. Doses range a lot, and we don't know a lot about doses. The typical dose, at least in North America, is three milligrams. A higher dose would be six milligrams. But actually, some of the children that I have with neurodevelopmental disorders take much higher doses, and I have seen very little in terms of uh, negative side effects from that. What melatonin does is it significantly decreases the time that it takes to fall asleep and improves the duration of sleep. And what's really interesting about this is as opposed to the drugs that I mentioned that are hypnotics or sleeping pills, which become habit forming and work less effectively with time to get tolerated to them, that's not true for melatonin. There are a significant number of individuals who benefit from melatonin, stay on melatonin for years and continue to benefit, which is why they keep taking it. It can have side effects, although this is one drug which when we studied it uh, was the only time I ever did a study where there were more side effects in the placebo than in the drug group. And I rarely have patient complaints of side effects. So obviously it causes drowsiness because it helps you fall asleep. But some patients occasionally have complained that they feel like they have a morning hangover, but it really is the exception. It also can cause vivid dreams. And some uh, reports say that it causes headache or dizziness, but I have not actually seen that. There are many other medications that we, because sleep is so problematic, and because we don't have the skills to provide the kind of behavioral treatment that I'm describing, the reality is that many individuals, especially those on stimulants, which further increase the difficulties some children have with falling asleep, we end up using other medications. So Benadryl, Clonidine, Trazodone, Mirtazapine, Prazosin is used for nightmares. These medications are being very widely prescribed for children and adults with ADHD. So in conclusion then, sleep and ADHD coexist. Sleep makes it much more difficult to control your inhibition and to pay attention. And ADHD, by virtue of the fact that it's dysregulating and disorganizing makes it much more difficult to fall asleep. So this is a bit of a vicious circle. If you treat ADHD, the ADHD will get better, but the sleep won't necessarily get better as a result. And if you treat the sleep problem, the ADHD may get a little bit better, but likely the ADHD will still need full treatment. So the reality is, this is a 24 hour disorder, but you have to treat it both at night and during the day. If you have somebody who is now able to manage their attention and hyperactivity during the day and able to sleep, they're functioning during the day and they're functioning at night, it's going to lead to a significant improvement in functioning. And that's how we get an optimal outcome. So I will stop there to make sure that there is a time for questions. Thank you, Dr. Margaret, uh, for the presentation. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that came in. So I will uh, begin uh, asking questions now. Um, so the first question is, have you ever seen uh, sleep wake disorder in a child as young as six, uh, 18 months old? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um... so, uh, the reality is that uh, individuals with ADHD um, are often uh, one of the early signs of ADHD can be difficulty with sleep regulation. So uh, difficulty with sleep, all kinds of difficulty with sleep and all kinds of difficulty with temperament often manifest from a very, very young age. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so one person is asking, um, if a child takes a medication for ADHD, um, earlier, were you saying that uh, melatonin does not work as well as sleep medication? No, I did not say that. So melatonin is extremely effective. And uh, what I said is the first intervention to consider is behavioral treatment. The second intervention to consider is melatonin. And the third intervention to consider is other medications for sleep. But uh, certainly before you would ever use another drug to help with sleep, you would want to make sure that there was good sleep hygiene and melatonin on board because both of those things work together to mutual benefit and have very little in terms of the way of side effects. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is, um, is uh, sleep walking common? Yes, so sleep walking, night terrors, all of those types of sleep problems are also more common in ADHD. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so next question is, what time is a good time for a teen to turn off the devices before bedtime? So the general recommendation is two hours before bedtime. One of the problems with screens is the blue light. And it's believed that the excess exposure to light is one of the things that makes it difficult to fall asleep. I think it's true that the blue light has an effect on sleep, but I also think that the intensity and engagement with games, oh, do a physical imitation. <laughs> that is not a sleep inducing activity. So something that calms you down is much more likely to induce sleep. So you really want to set it up. My general rule when I'm working with patients is that there's no gaming until homework's done. And then even when there is gaming, it doesn't go right until bedtime. It probably start, stops uh, about two hours before bedtime or at least an hour before bedtime to allow for the child to feel settled, to have another type of activity, to be able to, uh, if they need it, take their melatonin, uh, have a wind down time. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question is related to interactive metronome and the effects of sleep in a child with ADHD. Um, have you looked into that, uh, this topic and can you share anything about this? No, I don't know anything about an interactive metronome. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so, uh, Next question is, um, if we, uh, what is the recommendation if a child takes medication in the morning and then melatonin in the evening to be able to fall asleep by say 9.30 to 10 o'clock? Um, not giving them, not giving the child melatonin and let them fall asleep at the natural time or um, how much sleep is minimum for a child with ADHD at age 11? Well, at age 11, the normal recommendation is seven to nine hours, but I really think that what's important is to find out what works for your child. There are a lot of children out there, though, that are not getting enough sleep. They're very tired. And uh, although the average amount of sleep that children with ADHD is, are getting is six and a half hours, that's probably because most of them are sleep deprived. So uh, I think that, and you, you won't find that out until you actually find out what your kid looks like if they do get enough sleep. And because sleep is so impaired in ADHD and particularly impaired in, in ADHD adolescents, until you get them on a good sleep schedule and uh, decrease their access to things like games or Facebook or talking on the phone at night, that will impair their sleep, you're not gonna find out what they're like or how much sleep they need. 
So a uh, good sleep schedule, reduction of activities that decrease sleep and addition of melatonin are all things that you can do to optimize sleep and find out what your kid is like or what you are like if you're an adult, if you get a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next uh, question is, uh, is it okay to give a child melatonin every night for many years? Um, the child is a teenager and sometimes uh, will take a lot of melatonin impulsively. So what is the maximum dose that uh, the parents should be worry worrying about? Uh, there has never been shown to be any toxicity with excess melatonin. And there has also never been shown to be any tolerance. In other words, it's amazing to me, this is the only drug for which this is true. Melatonin continues to be effective uh, no matter how long you take it. And so many people take it for decades and there's no problem with that. Melatonin, because it's a hormone that's produced naturally by the body and a hormone that is not produced normally in people with ADHD, it's produced in an abnormal rhythm. It's produced 90 minutes later in the individuals with ADHD. We have not seen any ill effects. Uh, one of the sleep specialists that I know says the only danger of taking too much melatonin is you're going to have very expensive pee. And what she means by that is if you take more, you just pee it out. Uh, mm -hmm. I really, do, I don't think we know a lot about that, but I certainly have the clinical experience of uh, patients in my practice that take a lot of melatonin and take it for many years and it benefits them and they haven't had trouble. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question is, um, uh, how does ADHD medication affect sleep? That is a really interesting, really complicated question because there are two different answers. For all of the time that I have uh, studied ADHD, we have thought about sleep as a side effect of medication. And there is no question that one of the side effects of taking stimulants is that it's hard to fall asleep. So it can make it more difficult to fall asleep in some people, especially late in the day, when you take it late in the day. On the other hand, that's when we measure sleep as a side effect of stimulant treatment. When we start to look at sleep as an outcome for large groups of children taking stimulants, what we found is some children have sleep onset difficulties as a side effect, but the group as a whole actually was sleeping better. And that's been shown now in several studies. So sleep is a side effect of stimulant medication in some people. But if you look at groups of people on stimulants, both in children and adolescents and adults, the studies have shown that actually sleep improves over time when ADHD improves on stimulant, probably because everything else gets better as well, including the capacity to have a schedule. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so next question is, is there a specific test or procedure to test the function of the pineal gland? No. What no. we do is uh, you can measure dim light melatonin onset, but that's really not necessary. So what I would do is go back to the part of my slides over here. If you want to know about your sleep, you don't need a fancy lab test. All you need to do is look at uh, the schedule of when you're going to bed and when you're falling asleep, when you're waking up and when you're getting out of bed. And what you really want is for it to look. If it's looking like this, then it's really regular. You're going to bed at the same time every night and you're waking up at the same time every morning. You're getting a good night's sleep, no middle of the night wakening, and you're getting up and out of bed at the time that you're actually waking up. That's actually the ultimate test. Okay, thank you. 
Um, so does melatonin cause any disturbances to development or uh, long-term medical issues? There has been a lot of talk about that and there's been a lot of talk about melatonin and delayed puberty, but it's actually never been demonstrated. So at this point, I think we have decades of millions and millions and millions of people who are taking melatonin and they're not all ADHD. Melatonin is being used by lots of people. Um, and there are now pharmacoepidemiological studies in many populations uh, all over the world showing that melatonin is being used extraordinarily widely in the population at large. And there hasn't been any evidence of any long-term medical side effects. That's a very robust test. So for example, when we develop a new drug, we try to make sure that there are no medical difficulties or no long-term difficulties, but you don't see difficulties until a drug is tested in the population and nothing has ever been probably as widely used as melatonin and without any evidence of adverse effects. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if people take melatonin, does it have to be on a daily basis to be effective? No. Melatonin has two different actions. It's a chronobiotic, which means it regulates your circadian rhythm, your daily rhythm, but it's also hypnotic. In other words, if you take it a half an hour before you want to fall asleep, it's going to help you to fall asleep. And that action is ongoing and continues over time. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so do you have any um, experience in uh, treating children if other family members are not willing to change their own sleeping habits? And can you share your experience with that? Uh, you are going to have a lot of problems treating sleep in a child if, uh, if they don't have the opportunity to go to bed and to wake up on a regular schedule. So it's fine if the parent doesn't do that, if they set the child up to do that. The difficulty arises is that the parent who doesn't do that is likely to be the same parent who has a lot of trouble setting the child up to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... So uh, if a parent has uh, ADHD and sleep problem, and then the child also has ADHD and um, sleep problems, is sleep hygiene ever properly achieved or too uh, frustrating to try? Or just should they just go with melatonin? Uh, it's never either or. Melatonin works best in combination with sleep hygiene. If you take melatonin and you're wide awake, it doesn't do anything. And if you have a good sleep hygiene, but your brain isn't ready to fall asleep because melatonin isn't uh, adequate, you'll also have a big problem. So it's really the combination that is actually effective. And the treatment that I have been trying to describe is it's the rule, it's not the exception that there is a parent with ADHD who has a dysregulated sleep schedule and a child. So we treat both at the same time. And yes, that's not a hopeless situation. That's where we can be most beneficial. And yes, we can make that work. And when we do make that work, it's with the combination of sleep hygiene and melatonin. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, can you clarify, um, do children with ADHD need less sleep? I don't know that we know that they need less sleep. We know that they get less sleep, but we also know that they're extremely tired. And as I mentioned, you can be a child with ADHD and be totally hyper aroused and hyperactive and actually be uh, very, very overtired. So, uh, the fact that the child is hyperactive does not mean that they're not uh, overtired. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, next question is, is there any correlation between ADHD and chronic nightmares? 
Uh, yes. There, there's very few uh, sleep difficulties that don't uh, present as more common in individuals with ADHD. So that includes everything. Uh, I talked about restless leg syndrome, periodic limb movement syndrome. Uh, it's also true for nightmares. Uh, so all sleep problems are more common in ADHD. Okay. Um, let me move on to the next question. Um, so this person has um, eight-year-old son and um, for most of his life, uh, the parent has done a sleep ritual with, with the son. And uh, despite doing only calming things um, two hours before bedtime, um, the son is saying that his brain won't stop. So how can the parent help him, help him with that? Uh, so I think that's a really good question, a really important question, and it's a question that many parents in this audience will be able to uh, relate to, because the reality is that with ADHD, sometimes uh, good sleep training, good sleep hygiene actually isn't enough. There is something in uh, children, adolescents, and adults with ADHD that makes falling asleep more difficult. So yes, you start with a good schedule and you uh, start with sleep hygiene, but you may need to go further with melatonin or you may need to go further with other things as well, in which case you've got to refer yourself to the doctor to get advice about what to do about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can you discuss the effect of smoking marijuana before bed? Uh, as I said, it's a common reason for people to use marijuana because it helps them to fall asleep. That doesn't mean that I'm recommending marijuana to fall asleep. I don't think it's a good thing. The reason I don't think it's a good thing is because we know an awful lot about the neurotoxic effects of marijuana. There are better ways to treat the initial insomnia than to take something every day, which is actually going to decrease motivation and decrease uh, efficacy of cognition over time. So it's very common that that's what people have had access to, but it's certainly not something that I would recommend. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, um, melatonin is a hormone. So how, um, is it affected or influenced by perimenopause or menopause for people for women with ADHD? It is, mm -hmm. and uh, so is ADHD. So uh, we know a lot about sleep, and sleep becomes very difficult in lots of situations in life: stress, depression, menopause, pregnancy becomes more and more difficult with age. All of those things have significant impacts on sleep. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so sleeping issues in an adult with uh, ADHD, is that similar to um, what children and adolescents experience? Or is it because they haven't learned um, the idea of sleep hygiene or control on a self-regulation? Definitely both. The problems that I described uh, start from day one and they go through for many decades. So adults with ADHD have the same biological difficulties with sleep that young children do. But they also carry a lifetime of history of not having uh, had satisfying sleep or the experience of knowing that with particular routines, they will fall asleep. So the result is a combination of difficulties that makes sleep very difficult in adults. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so next uh, question, this person has a son who had um, anxiety attacks when he tried melatonin and um, he's scared to try it again. Um, he said he would um, take it when he would wake several times, wake up several times and um, his body was very tired and his but his brain was not. Have you heard of children experience this effect? No, I haven't. 
and I've used an awful lot of melatonin. I've never seen melatonin cause anxiety. So I think that the child is actually anxious about taking a drug. So what I would suggest is uh, the possibility of uh, some kind of uh, way of saying to the child, okay, I'm going to give you melatonin and instead of giving melatonin, give some kind of a mimic placebo, uh, a different liquid and seeing whether the same effect occurs. Because I don't think it's likely that that's the melatonin. I think that's probably more the child's concern about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so this person's son uh, goes to bed at uh, different times, but he always wake up at the same time every day. So is there a way to keep him uh, sleeping for the times when he has to go to bed later? You don't want to do that. Hmm. Um, so, uh, if, if what's going to happen is if you let him sleep in, he's going to have more night to night variability. So the fact that this child is waking up at the same time every morning is probably a good thing. I don't know what is the cause of his having variability when he falls asleep, but we, you really have to look into that very carefully. If he's doing, uh, let's say football or hockey or something like that, um, and he's getting home, I've seen this quite a bit, at 9 p.m. and then he's expected to do his homework, have some dinner and then fall asleep, that's not a schedule that's gonna be uh, conducive to sleep. So I would really wanna know what are the patterns, and this is where a sleep log like this one would be effective. What are the patterns for the nights that he's not falling asleep? Are those nights where he's anxious and has a test? Are those nights where he's doing some kind of activity late at night? Is there something else going on? Because most kids who have a, a regular time to wake up and nothing else that's impeding sleep will develop a normal sleep schedule. Okay, thank you. Um, so this person's son is eight years old with uh, ADHD and anxiety, and uh, he loves to uh, fall asleep in the parents' bed. So is it best to support this every night or to encourage him to be comfortable in his uh, own uh, room or bed? Well, I'm sure the pediatrician is going to tell you that he needs to learn to sleep in his own bed. Um, I, I think that the, uh, one of the problems with having children fall asleep in your bed is unless you're going to have them there all night, when they wake up in the middle of the night, let's say you fall asleep in your parents' bed and then the parents move you when you wake up in the middle of the night, we usually have a time in the middle of the night when kids do wake up a little bit, they're going to need to get back in the bed to go back to sleep. So most families can't function with the kid in the bed all the time. If your kid's in the bed all the time, that doesn't give you a lot of parent time. And they also can't function with kids that wake them up in the middle of the night. So it just doesn't actually work out well for most families to have the kids sleeping in the family bed all the time. Whether or not it's bad for the sleep is a different question. But what they've learned is I talked about a sight gaver. Instead of a teddy bear, they've got the parent bed. And so they have developed a pattern where their association to falling asleep is being with the uh, parent. Once that pattern is entrenched and that's what the kid knows and they're anxious, changing that is probably going to require some professional treatment. It's not that easy. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll do uh, two more questions. Um, um, so is there uh, any evidence um, for non-behavioral and non-medication options uh, that to improve uh, sleep in kids with ADHD? So non-medication options such as uh, weighted blankets or compression blankets. Uh, weighted blankets were originally used for autism, but they've been a mixed bag. And so I would be uh, somewhat cautious. I, I, uh, saying, uh, is there any option to help people fall asleep that's not behavioral and not medication is a kind of saying, uh, 
taking away all the options that are out there. There is no magic bullet. A, a, putting a weighted blanket on a child is not going to, it is a behavioral intervention. It's not going to help them fall asleep if they don't have a regular sleep schedule. Okay, thank you. Um, so the last question is, is there any correlation between ADHD, sleeping issues, and bed wetting for an eight-year-old? Sorry, I didn't understand. Any correlation between ADHD sleep issues and what? Bed wetting for eight year eight year olds. Bed wetting enuresis is the medical term for that. Bed wetting is extremely common in ADHD, especially in boys, and it goes on for a long time. I have seen ADHD adolescent boys who continue to have enuresis. I don't know that that's actually a sleep problem. I think it's a uh, problem in its own right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Margaret, for answering all our uh, uh, questions. Um, we know that time is tight and we can't answer all the questions we have. So for people with uh, additional questions that's not being answered, we welcome you to email us at info at cadac.ca. So that's info at cadac.ca. And um, the, the email address is in the chat box uh, below. So um, we'll welcome you to email us the questions and then we will respond to you on that. Uh, with that said, thank you again, uh, Dr. Margaret, for uh, speaking with us tonight. It's very informational and detailed. And uh, we want to thank uh, everybody uh, for joining us tonight. Um, just a note that uh, this is uh, being recorded. So uh, by end of this week, we will be sending a recording of the session plus the presentation notes um, to people who have registered. Uh, once again, thank you very much all and um, have a good evening. Thank you.